When Animal Crossing New Horizons released one year ago today, I made a video titled, Why Reviewing Animal Crossing New Horizons is Kinda Pointless. Despite what the title may imply, the video wasn't created to try and say that reviewing Animal Crossing New Horizons was something that shouldn't or couldn't be done, but rather that it seemed a little silly to already see reviews being put out for the game. Animal Crossing's greatest strength as a series is its use of the passage of time. The real-time clock is such an essential part of AC's identity, so the idea of playing New Horizons for a couple of weeks and giving the entire game a review score didn't exactly sit well with me. This is of course no fault of the actual reviewers, since their job is to put out a review for the game within a specific time frame, regardless of whether said game would benefit from a few extra weeks, months, or even a year. I didn't actually expect any major channels or outlets to make some sort of exception, since that would be completely nonsensical. But despite this, I wasn't able to take any of the reviews completely seriously for the sole reason that they only covered, that they were only capable of covering, a fraction of everything Animal Crossing has to offer. As such, I viewed them as more of a first impressions type of thing, something to give me a faint idea of what to expect from the series' newest entry. They could tell me about the visuals, the quality of some of the new mechanics, and the dialogue for instance, but in terms of long term enjoyment, I knew that was something I'd have to discover for myself when I picked up the game. Despite my channel being much smaller in March of last year, I still had a lot of people asking me when my review for New Horizons would be going up, since the internet was just littered with them at the time. Yet my answer was always firm. I would take one year to fully experience everything Animal Crossing New Horizons had to offer, and only then would I put up my review. And here we are. As insane as it is to realize, New Horizons has been in our hands for an entire year now. So I'm here to honor my promise and fully review the game. And I'm going to do it right. No stone will go unturned, every nook and cranny will be explored until I emerge with my final rating for Animal Crossing New Horizons. But I've kept you guys waiting for an entire year, so let's not waste any more time and get into this review. Breath of the Wild, Mario Odyssey, Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. Time and time again, the Nintendo Switch has given us titles that have completely blown expectations for their respective franchises out of the water. During this generation, Nintendo has dropped so many games that take their series to new heights, ones that we never expected or thought could never be achieved. So naturally, for the first three years of the Switch's life, I eagerly and impatiently awaited for my favorite franchise's next entry, knowing the insane potential the game held. Oh. Well, I was also anxiously waiting for the next Animal Crossing game, which had quickly become the most anticipated title of my lifetime. New Leaf was an incredible experience for me that was unmatched by any other video game, including other Animal Crossing games, so I was practically drooling at the idea of a new title that somehow surpassed what I believed to be a near perfect gaming achievement. A game that expanded the series to a level we couldn't fathom, like Breath of the Wild and Odyssey did for their franchises. And on a fateful day in September of 2018, the painful 5 year long wait finally appeared to have a light at the end of the tunnel. Animal Crossing Switch was formally announced and fans of the series rejoiced. Nine months later, the game was officially shown off at E3 as Animal Crossing New Horizons, the brand new entry in our favorite life simulator series. And nine months after that, fast forwarding past the pain and suffering of waiting for new information, the game was finally in our hands. After 2,695 days since the last entry, the long-awaited Animal Crossing 5 was available for us to sink our teeth into. And my teeth have been sunk into it for a year now, so let's talk about it. Animal Crossing New Horizons naturally had a lot of high expectations to meet. I mean, when you've got a series with a typical gap of 3-4 to four years between game releases, a 7 year long wait is certainly going to cause people to anticipate something big. I know I was. And while the game didn't deliver on every front as we'll get into later, the first thing I want to talk about is the main thing that didn't just meet my expectations, but surpassed them. And surpassed them to a level I never anticipated. The visuals. Animal Crossing New Horizons is a gorgeous game and is without a doubt one of the best looking games on the Switch. I'd put it in the top 3. It's hardly anything groundbreaking on a technical level, but it's the embodiment of everything I expected from a current gen Animal Crossing game and more. 
I think the game's greatest strength in terms of looks is the lighting. The sun and moon in New Horizons light up the world in such a beautiful way, which makes the game a visual feast no matter what time of day it is. Every time I play this game in the evening, I'm incapable of not taking a minute to appreciate how the setting sun drapes your island in a warm, orange glow. The shadows are also done expertly in New Horizons. Aside from some occasional pop-in from time to time, they only add to the immersion of your island life by grounding the game's art style in a more realistic manner. And speaking of art style, that's something else I think New Horizons perfects. Animal Crossing has always had a distinct style, and naturally, that style progressed in each entry. Well, except from GameCube to Wild World, that was a uh, sort of a downgrade. But New Horizons feels like it captures the coziness and charm of Animal Crossing through its visuals more than any other game in the series. You could argue that that's simply because it's running on the most powerful system the series has been on to date, so of course it's going to look better than previous entries, but that shouldn't devalue the game's incredible art direction. It goes for a much softer look than past games, which fits the series perfectly. I really respect the restraint that the developers had with this game's look. I mean, they could have gone all out with trying to make New Horizons look like a highly realistic, much more visually demanding version of previous games' art styles, but instead, they went for a more nuanced approach, letting the phenomenal lighting system do most of the heavy lifting instead of going crazy and over-texturing the game. Just look at this game in comparison to Amiibo Festival, for example. The difference is night and day. New Horizons also takes weather into account in regards to its visuals more than any game preceding it, and for the most part, it's all very subtle. Even on a sunny day, you'll occasionally see the shadow of a cloud passing overhead, briefly blocking out the light and coating you in a cool shade. The wind is an ever-changing element of the game, sometimes blowing wildly and sometimes simply moving a leaf or two on a tree, but it all adds to the immersion of the world. Rain in this game is absolutely stunning. Just like the wind, it often varies in intensity, ranging from light showers with very few clouds present to raging thunderstorms, the latter being an incredible delight. The way the lightning envelops the world in brightness for a brief moment, only to return to the darkness seconds later, it's amazing. I love seeing the raindrops leave faint droplets in the river or bounce off the top of my umbrella. The seasons in this game are also gorgeous, which comes as no surprise. Each one of them is visually distinct and beautiful in their own way. Fall specifically has to be the game's greatest feat in terms of graphical prowess. The golden look of the entire island, the style of the weeds, the way the light highlights all the right elements, it's just phenomenal and is absolutely one of the best things I've seen on the Switch, or even by Nintendo in general. New Horizons has so much attention to detail in its visuals, and that only aids in getting the player to feel like they're truly a part of the world being presented to them. I couldn't have asked for anything better. While we're on the subject of visuals though, we should also discuss the game's atmosphere. Atmosphere is a huge part of Animal Crossing, so naturally, it's important that the game gets it right. And honestly, it only half does. Like I said, the visuals are phenomenal, and that's a major part of setting a game's atmosphere. Unfortunately, that's only one side of the coin. We've also got the other side, aka the soundtrack. Animal Crossing music is special. I don't think anyone would object to that. New Leaf and Wild World slash City Folk have some of my favorite soundtracks ever in gaming, and that's mostly because of how incredible they are at setting the atmosphere for the franchise. When I close my eyes and listen to the music from those two games, I can picture myself living the life of my character. A life of peace and serenity, where you can live in a small town and get to spend your days fishing, planting flowers, and talking to your neighbors. All of that is represented in the music alone, the pure essence of the series, captured in a simple compilation of notes. I don't think that New Horizons soundtrack is bad, necessarily. There are a lot of really catchy tunes within it, ones that I can find myself humming along to throughout the day. But it feels like it lacks direction. In a video I made a few weeks ago, I mentioned how in New Leaf and City Folk, every music track has a purpose in the grander story the hourly music is attempting to tell, that being the story of the day's progression. Pieces lead into the next, following the player through their journey and adapting properly to fit the mood or tone of that specific hour. New Horizons just doesn't do that. Like I said, it has some good music, but it doesn't feel cohesive in the slightest. Sometimes a track will set a mood only for it to be completely abandoned by the next track. Sometimes a piece of music will play that I can't for the life of me understand why it was chosen for a specific hour. And so many of the pieces, while good, are just incredibly unfitting. 
Listen to this. This is so loud and highly energetic. Why is this 8 a.m.? And that brings me to another issue with the soundtrack, the instrumentation. Now, don't get me wrong, it's not all bad. The acoustic guitar is a great choice and fits the series perfectly while also representing island life in a great way. But the synth, oh, the synth. I'm sorry, I just can't vibe with this thing. It gives the whole soundtrack a really unnatural tone and works against the game's atmosphere in such an annoying way. It's not always terrible and is occasionally used well, like in 7am for example, another terribly fitting yet incredibly catchy track, but most of the time I just wish it was replaced by almost anything else. It's no wonder that 2am and 6am are my favorite music tracks in the game since they abandon it completely and instead return to the superior instrumentation of New Leaf and City Folk, soundtracks that captured the essence of Animal Crossing perfectly. I'd even argue that the GameCube soundtrack was more cohesive and well thought out than New Horizons, and trust me, I'm not the biggest advocate of the GameCube soundtrack. Something else I began to detest during my time with New Horizons was the overuse of the main theme. Look, I like this game's main theme. Is it the weakest of the series? Yes, but it's still pretty good. It's wacky, yet still captures the Animal Crossing charm, be it in a more unconventional way. I'm sure a lot of people that started with this game, or even longtime fans, are going to have very fond memories of it once we move on to the next title in a few years. But the problem is that it's crammed into everything. And yes, previous games in the series also integrated the main theme into the hourly soundtrack. It's pretty much a tradition. But the difference with those is that it was way more subtle. In previous Animal Crossing soundtracks, the main theme was used in so many different ways. While some were more obvious than others, each one felt like it properly adapted to the theme of the song it was a part of, being changed in various ways to ensure a smooth insertion. New Horizons, on the other hand, lacks restraint in contrast to its visuals. It feels like every time you pick up the game, the composers are like, hey, just in case you forgot this was New Horizons, da 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 Like, jeez, give me some time to breathe. It was done in an attempt to make the soundtrack feel more connected, but only works to make what's already a very samey compilation of music feel even less distinct. The funniest thing is that I really enjoy the rest of New Horizons' soundtrack aside from the hourly music. The game's event themes and shop themes are great. I mean, have you heard the minigame music? It's amazing! And while we're still a ways away from talking about the game's holidays in a broader sense, each one of the holiday themes is incredible. I firmly believe that New Horizons gave us the best version of all of these iconic songs, aside from maybe the Toy Day theme. That New Leaf version is so deliciously nostalgic, it's hard to decide for me. Before we move on from the game's presentation to actual gameplay, there is one more thing I should bring up here, being the sound design. And it's really solid. Just like the visuals, the sound effects are used to immerse yourself in the world and do a fantastic job of that. Subtle things like the pitter-patter of rain or the chirping of cicadas during the summer do wonders for the game's atmosphere. Everything sounds great. Except for the waterfalls. Why are the waterfalls so loud? In the past, I've said that I believe there are two main things that define Animal Crossing. The atmosphere, which we've discussed, and the progression. And I think the latter is something much more difficult to pull off. Yes, it's still difficult to create an atmosphere as perfect as previous Animal Crossing games, but making an excellent progression system is on a whole other level. There's so many things that you have to account for to make it work. The system has to fit hundreds or even thousands of potential playstyles and approaches while still offering proper engagement for the player, and of course has to be a decent length so there's always something to do. Past Animal Crossing games really nailed this, especially New Leaf, and that's one of the reasons I fell in love with the series. Which is why it hurt so much to see New Horizons completely blow it. I know how blunt that sounds, but honestly, New Horizons progression system, or lack thereof, is the most infuriating part of this game. Ignoring the extended tutorial until you get KK Slider, which lasts about two weeks, and trust me, I'll talk about it later, what progression system is there? You of course have the museum collectibles to search for, and fishing and bug catching are as fun as ever. But that's just a typical Animal Crossing activity, not something that's supposed to carry an entire game's progression system. What is there to unlock? A single shop upgrade that takes a month to get, out of the game's mind-bogglingly low number of two shops? Is that seriously it? Mind you, this is coming off the heels of New Leaf, which literally had an entire street solely dedicated to unlocking and upgrading various shops, giving the player an incredible visual sense of progression as they do so. 
It took me more than a year to achieve the fully upgraded main street, and even longer to get all the town buildings like the police station. And you're telling me all of New Horizons offerings can be achieved in a month? But don't worry, I haven't forgotten about the Nook Mileage program. Nook Miles are a new system in New Horizons that reward you from doing typical Animal Crossing tasks, like fishing or talking to animals. These miles can then be used to make certain purchases. I actually love the idea of Nook Miles and think they should definitely stay in the series. Actually getting physical rewards for doing these activities is a really cool concept and I'm glad it's in New Horizons. But it has to be made clear that this is in no way a substitute for an actual progression system. There are no unlocks, no special rewards for completing these challenges, just miles. Which are nice, but aren't anything special. The whole point of building or character unlocks in previous games is that more often than not, they gave you access to something entirely new. Not only did that offer incredible incentive to achieve the goal required to get this new feature, but it also gave you more reason to play once you got it, because it's just one more thing that you can do in your daily routine. Nook Miles, while great, aren't that, and would work much better in a game with an actual progression system, or heck, any progression system at all. They pretty much had a beta version of them in New Leaf's Welcome Amiibo update with the Meow tasks, and they were great because it supplemented the long-term goals with smaller, more immediate ones. Miles alone aren't a good enough incentive to make me go, oh boy, time to catch 500 bugs, but if the game was like, hey, if you catch 500 bugs, you unlock Nat's bug catching shop, or even something way simpler like, hey, if you catch 500 bugs, you unlock this awesome unbreakable bug net given to you by Nat himself, then heck yeah am I excited to catch 500 bugs. It's all about giving the player proper motivators, something that New Horizons unfortunately fails at. But hey, speaking of Nat, this seems like a good time to talk about the game's characters. It's pretty crazy that I've made it 16 minutes into a review about Animal Crossing New Horizons, but I've hardly talked about the animals themselves. As the title would imply, animals, both villagers and special characters, are a major part of the series, so it's obviously important that they're done right. Let's talk about the special characters first, who, for the most part, are handled very well. Right from the get-go, we've got Tom Nook once again taking the lead after his more minor role in New Leaf, which I was happy to see considering I always preferred him to Isabel, please don't hurt me. As per usual, he's well written, and Timmy and Tommy are as well. Characters like Blathers, the Able Sisters, and KK Slider are still a delight, as are the special holiday animals. And then there's of course the new characters, who are amazing. Orville and Wilbur are the clear highlight here, having majorly important roles and being incredibly charming. Their airplane lingo is hilarious even if it does repeat a little too often, and I never want to see another game without them. Then, you have the three replacements of Flick, Daisy May, and CJ. I'll be honest, I don't really care for these three in a character sense, but two out of the three of them have really excellent and distinct designs, so I'll take it. But yeah, New Horizons has special characters right. There's really only one teensy tiny unimportant minuscule little issue. Where is everybody? You guys knew it was only a matter of time before I got to this. I don't understand how you can just drop as many characters as this game did, especially in a series like Animal Crossing. These games are built on their characters and the attachment that players have to them. It's a series about community, one that starts off small but slowly grows into something more substantial. And the lovable characters are such a major, essential portion of that community, so to just see them poofed out of existence is horrible. Especially ones who've been here since the beginning or are particularly memorable. Pete, the mailman, gone. Pelly and Phyllis, gone. Tortimer, a majorly important character and the mayor up until New Leaf, gone, presumed dead. Cap'n, gone. Gracie, gone. Brewster, gone. And that's just a small number of the dozens of characters removed from New Horizons. The lack of characters makes the whole experience feel really shallow, like there's simply no more growth your community can have after a few months. Which is true! And I know that some of you will say that a lot of these characters will absolutely come back in future updates, but trust me, we'll definitely be talking about that soon enough. In the meantime, let's take a look at the regular animals. How does New Horizons handle them? And the answer is really mixed. The best thing about the basic villagers in New Horizons is how much personality they have when you're just observing them. Unlike in past games where they sort of just walked around aimlessly or sat inside their houses, animals actually take part in activities now. You can find them in the middle of a workout, singing a song with a friend in the plaza, or sitting in the middle of a path that you're trying to terraform. 
They even change their clothes based off of their current activity or the weather. It adds a lot of charm to them and gives them a lot more depth. So yeah, the animals are pretty great when you're not talking to them. The problem is when you are. Look, New Horizons Villager dialogue is probably the game's most highly criticized element, so I'm not going to dwell on it for too long. You all know what most people think. It's repetitive, it's basic, and a lot of it can be straight up uninteresting. It makes the animals feel more like a part of your island's decorations rather than people you want to engage in conversation with. But before we move on, I'd like to bring up a common point made against this complaint. That New Leaf dialogue was never all that great either, and people just hate against New Horizons because it's new. And part of that is somewhat correct. While I still think it was better than New Horizons animal dialogue, New Leafs wasn't all that phenomenal either. I think we can all agree that that peaked with Wild World. But there are two things that have to be taken into account here. One, New Leaf had a boatload of special characters to interact with. Because New Horizons lacks them, it leaves the villagers to do all the heavy lifting, something that they're clearly incapable of doing. And two, do you know what New Leaf added? 100 new animals, 2 new species, and 2 new personality types. That alone was all it needed to spice up normal villager interactions. Do you know what New Horizons added? 7 new animals, 0 new species, and 0 new personality types. It hardly gave us anything new, and what was carried over from New Leaf is now debatably worse. Before we move on from characters, I do want to bring up the game's traveling animals and holiday events, which I believe are executed poorly and adequately, respectively. I know some of you must have raised an eyebrow when I mentioned the game's two shops before, because surely I would have to count the traveling salesmen. But do I? I'm sorry, but there's no excitement or intrigue that comes from Leaf or Kick sitting on a blanket in the plaza, especially after the previous game when they had their own stores. In fact, it can even be annoying. In New Leaf, if you wanted shoes or bushes, then you could simply go to the stores on Main Street and buy those shoes or bushes. In New Horizons, well, you better hope that Kicks or Leaf haven't already come that week, because otherwise you're out of luck and have to impatiently wait for their next unscheduled arrival. Most of the other travelers simply aren't interesting. Gulliver's fun quiz is gone and he instead makes you dig things up over and over, CJ and Flick while not attorneys are almost solely used for selling fish and bugs to unless you want a model of something, Wisp's task is debatably even more boring and repetitive than Gulliver's, having to catch his 5 pieces for rewards that aren't even that good, and it's not like you can eventually get some of these people as permanent residents or shopkeepers, nope, they just make you do these mundane tasks ad nauseum, with most of them lacking worthwhile prizes. Holidays in New Horizons are pretty okay for the most part. The music and visuals for them are great, as I've said, but unfortunately, most of them just don't bring anything new to the table. The vast majority of the game's holidays are just watered-down takes on the New Leaf versions, like Toy Day for example. In New Leaf, you gathered information about what gifts your animals wanted throughout the month. They would tell you about the color, type of item, etc. Then, when the special day rolled around, you were tasked by Jingle to deliver presents in your Santa costume, using the tips you had gathered throughout the month to hopefully hand out all the right gifts and make your neighbors happy. In New Horizons, you simply craft some wrapping paper and give out random gifts to villagers, it doesn't matter which. You don't even have to be Santa anymore. I think this is representative of how New Horizons handles most of its holidays. They're not bad per se, but you can't really enjoy them that much when you know it's just a slightly worse version of what came before. Halloween was my favorite because despite the day itself being a watered down version of the prior event, it introduced pumpkins during the month of October, actually giving the player a fun new thing to focus on. It was nice. Well, so far we've talked about the game's unfitting music, lack of a progression system, and now lack of characters. So what does New Horizons provide? Two things really. Crafting, and the big one, designing. When New Horizons was first revealed, I didn't know how to feel about the addition of crafting. I never liked Pocket Camp and hated crafting in that game, so to me, it almost seemed like bad news and something that would harm the game more than it helped it. And after a year of playing New Horizons, I can gladly say that I was wrong. Crafting is amazing and I never want to see another Animal Crossing game without it. Gathering materials to make your own furniture is genius and makes designing your island feel all the more personal and enjoyable. It feels like you actually have to work to get the items you want, which is a great feeling in a game that lacks a real progression system. However, as I'm sure most of you guys have realized, it's still a majorly flawed system, despite its inherent genius. 
There's of course the infamous inability to craft multiple things at a time, which does majorly suck, don't get me wrong, but my main issue is with the DIY recipes themselves. Like, holy cow, who sat down and decided to make this system as terrible as it is? The concept of collecting different recipes across the time you play the game is of course a good one, but the execution is laughably bad. The insane amount of repeats you get becomes genuinely aggravating, especially when you're searching or, more accurately, waiting for a specific recipe. I'm still trying to get the garden bench one year later. It would be way more bearable if the game actually gave priorities to recipes you didn't know, so you don't get a bunch of repeats that do nothing but fill up your inventory until you sell them for next to nothing, throw them out, or drop them in your house. And to add insult to injury, if you're trying to get a DIY recipe from an animal who's crafting in their home, the game gives you the option to decline a new recipe, but forces you to take an old one. Why? How is that an oversight that gets made and sticks around for an entire year? DIYs aside, another major issue with crafting is tool durability. I made an entire video about this that was essentially just me venting about how annoying and nonsensical the system is. I understand flimsy tools breaking, because that in and of itself acts like a mini tutorial. It teaches you to craft and gather materials until you get the real thing. But I stand by the fact that regular tools breaking makes absolutely no sense and is terrible game design. What is gained from my tools breaking? Oh, I'm chopping down these trees, but uh oh, my axe is broken, time to drop everything that I'm doing and grab all the materials I need from either outside or my in-home storage, or go to the store and buy a new one. It does nothing aside from disrupt gameplay and doesn't benefit the player in any way, shape, or form. And as if that's not bad enough, the golden tools break too? Why? Whose idea was this? As if the game didn't already have an incentive problem, why am I going to spend my time unlocking these fancy tools that have no special abilities and break the same way the regular ones do? It's a baffling design choice. But now, we come to the supposed crown jewel of Animal Crossing New Horizons, the designing. Designing was always a prevalent part of the Animal Crossing series, but New Horizons has taken it further than ever by having the system be its sole priority. So, with everything else that was sacrificed for this designing system, you'd think it would be really excellent, right? Well... Okay, let's start with the good stuff first, because despite my tone, there is a lot of good stuff here. New Horizons gives the player more options for creativity than ever before, and that's a really good thing. Have you seen some of the incredible islands people have created in this game? It's amazing! Fans are going to flex their creative muscles no matter how much power you give them, but once they've gotten a tool like terraforming, there's really no limit to what they can do. Also, furniture outside! I don't know how it took this long for the series to include this, and it's one of the simplest yet most game-changing features in New Horizons. I'll be honest, I don't usually subscribe to the idea that a new Animal Crossing game releasing makes the previous ones worse when you go back to it, but I'll fully admit that it just feels wrong playing past games and not having the ability to place furniture outside, like you're being heavily restricted. New Horizons gives the player so much freedom in terms of designing, and that's something I can only respect. Unfortunately, like many things in New Horizons, the system is still riddled with problems. My first issue is how dull and arduous the terraforming process can be. Now, there are some people that think we should be able to simply enter a designer mode while terraforming, like we can in our houses to pick up furniture and place it wherever we want, but I heavily disagree. No offense to those who want it, but that would probably be the most immersion breaking the thing the game could possibly employ. And aside from that, I do think that terraforming should be something that you have to do physically, because it makes the end result all the more satisfying. But there are so many better ways they could have done it. Right now, no matter what you're terraforming, be it a path, river, or cliff, you're forced to interact with one tile at a time. This can make the process incredibly boring, especially if you're doing a major project like placing a bunch of cliffs or creating a plaza with a bunch of path tiles. And there's such a simple solution to this too. What if you could upgrade your terraforming tools from the Nook Stop in Resident Services using Nook Miles? The default version could be the one we currently have, allowing the player to build things one tile at a time. But then, there could be a silver pack, letting you hold the button and fill up four tiles with one swift motion. And moving even further, there could be a gold pack, allowing the player to build on nine tiles at a time by simply holding the button for a little longer. It would make terraforming so much more enjoyable and less draining than it currently is, while still keeping that physical element and also giving the player more to look forward to after initially unlocking the feature. 
Aside from terraforming, many of my design issues carry over to the game's handling of furniture. I already discussed the baffling nature of the DIY recipes, but the normal furniture can be just as bad. For some reason, when you buy a piece of furniture from Nook's Cranny, you're unable to customize it, despite the game's whole identity being customization. And you can't even order the item in different colors. So all you can do is hope against hope that eventually, the kiddie pool will return and maybe, just maybe, it'll be blue this time. And what's even worse are the items special to the Nook Stop. When you choose your island, you get a random set of these pieces of furniture that you don't choose, mind you, and you're completely stuck with. Forever. And it's not like these are worthless items, no. These are important. Street lamps, benches, park clocks, all things that avid designers will want to use in their towns dozens of times, yet the game ties you down to a specific version of that item that, chances are, you'll most likely not want to use. Why? Like, I get that it's supposed to encourage co-op play and trading and stuff like that, but there are better ways to do so that don't involve directly impeding the player's progress until they get their friend to send them the right phone box. The problem with New Horizons is that it puts all of its eggs into this designing basket, and not only do the other elements of the game obviously suffer because of this, but do you know what else suffers? The designing! Because when you have that many eggs, the basket will inevitably start to crack. New Horizons' sole and complete dedication to customization and design makes elements that were once bearable in past games frustrating in this one. The concept of a new building or bridge taking a day to complete was once a charming addition to Animal Crossing's incredible immersion with its real-time clock, but in New Horizons, it feels annoying to only be able to do one thing like this at a time because there's nothing else. No supplementation with your charming daily routine, no distractions with witty dialogue from animals or a multitude of interesting and hilarious characters, nothing. This, this is it. This is all there is. If you couldn't tell up to this point, I'm not the biggest designer in Animal Crossing, and I never was. The reason I played the games were for the amazing atmosphere, lovable characters, and engaging progression system. Animal Crossing was a form of escapism for me, like it was for many people. A second life in a second world. And unfortunately, I just can't get that experience from New Horizons. It's not a terrible game despite all my criticisms, but it's not the Animal Crossing that I love. It's something completely different because almost all of my favorite elements of the series are either gone or altered to the point of unrecognizability. When I'm feeling overwhelmed and feel like I need an escape, I'll simply grab my 3DS and play some New Leaf or even Wild World. Because New Horizons is impressive from a creative standpoint, but those games, as well as GameCube and City Folk, have the heart that made me an Animal Crossing fan to begin with. However, I actually don't think New Horizons is all bad. Despite it failing at most of the important aspects I brought up, there was actually a part of the game that succeeded in almost all of them. A glimmer of hope in the dark cave of island life. And that was the tutorial. New Horizons tutorial, being the start of the game up until you unlock KK Slider, is often underappreciated because most people just wanted to rush through it so they could unlock terraforming. But in my eyes, it is absolutely the best part of the game, even achieving the quality of past Animal Crossing titles, probably surpassing some of them. Repetitive music aside, the tutorial did everything that I wanted from a new Animal Crossing game. It began with placing you on a deserted island with only two other animals, which gives you a real sense of isolation in comparison to past games. The island is completely overgrown with weeds, and you're incentivized to clean it up so you can begin the development of your paradise. For those two weeks, it felt like every day had something new to do. On one of them, you're collecting iron nuggets to give to Timmy and Tommy so they can get their first store on the island running. On another, you're gathering bugs for Tom Nook so he can convince Blathers to move to the island. There was always something new and exciting to take part in. Gathering new tools, exploring new areas, meeting new people, it was all excellently crafted. And it also did an excellent job of introducing the game's new features, like crafting and Nook Miles. After completing whatever main task you were doing that day, you could simply relax, maybe do some fishing, and prepare for whatever the next day had in store. It was a near perfect system, and one that kept me engaged and excited every single day. Which is why it felt so strange for it to be followed by just... nothing. I know a lot of people said that the end of the tutorial was when the game really got started, since it was essentially releasing your shackles and letting you do whatever you wanted, and it's true that Animal Crossing is about freedom. But every game still has things to accomplish after the initial few weeks, and New Horizons is the only exception. 
The only possible long-term goal you have is to design your paradise, but if you're not into designing like me and many others who preferred the progression aspect of the series, you'll most likely just feel... lost. While technically not being a part of the actual gameplay, there is one more thing I want to talk about before I wrap up this review. The updates. New Horizons has gotten a multitude of updates since it's launched and is confirmed to get them continuously for years to come. And that all sounds well and good. But, and I hate to sound like a broken record here, I think it's a majorly flawed system. The way I see it, there are two main issues with the updates that sort of feed into each other and make the main problem. The first is the time between updates. New Horizons updates are normally about bi-monthly, which doesn't sound too bad on its own. But the problem comes with issue number two, being that this is all old stuff. We're waiting for months, only to be given things that were in the base game of an 8-year-old 3DS title. Things that, frankly, should have been here since the beginning. Like, it took 4 months for swimming to be added and 5 for dreaming, which is just insane. A lot of people argue that this is actually good for New Horizons, since it'll extend the game's lifetime and have players coming back for more every few months. And that does sound good, on paper. I don't think that having updates themselves is the issue. My issue is the content of the updates that we're currently getting. If we had all these basic Animal Crossing things in the game at launch, and the updates were adding new, exciting features like farming, new characters, and new shops, I don't think anyone would be complaining. But unfortunately, that's not the case. Another minor issue I have with the updates is how they deprive the player of any feeling of accomplishment. When something gets added via update, like Red's art section in the museum for example, I don't feel like I unlocked it. It just feels like Nintendo said, okay, you can have this now. It's something everyone will get at the exact same time, not because of their own work and dedication, but because Nintendo decided it was finally time to add it to the game. Animal Crossing New Horizons is an interesting game, and one that I evidently have a lot of mixed feelings about. The game does a lot right, and takes a lot of steps in the right direction, yet it feels like with every step it leaves three things behind. Overall, I think how much you enjoy this game will depend on what kind of Animal Crossing fan you are. If you are always there for the customization and design, it's likely that this is your favorite game in the franchise because you really get to flex your creativity. And I completely respect that. But if you're more like me, someone who's more interested in the progression, atmosphere, and characters of the franchise, it's likely that you are a little disappointed with New Horizons, maybe very disappointed. And that's just as understandable. I once again don't think New Horizons is a bad game, it's just not the Animal Crossing game for me. At the end of the day, I think the best representation of New Horizons comes from within the game itself. The museum. The museum in this game is absolutely gorgeous. It's truly a marvel to look at. You're just awestruck by it when you first visit. Everything seems so meticulous and well thought out. But as you come back to the museum time and time again, you begin to realize that it lacks substance. There's nothing for you to actually do while you're in there. You've seen the exhibit, and that's it. It's pretty, but there's nothing else to be gained. I give Animal Crossing New Horizons a 6 out of 10. Anyways, if you've made it this far into the video, thank you so much for your patience. And not just your patience through this really long video, but for the year that it took me to make this review. I really wanted to do it right and capture all my thoughts and feelings on the game, which I think I was able to do well. But as per usual, I'd love to hear what you guys think. What are your thoughts on Animal Crossing New Horizons? Is it an excellent masterpiece, a disappointment, or something in between? And what do you want to see added to the game? Let me know in the comments below and I'll see you all later. Protendo, out.